So you all have this book with you right now? Three principal aspects of the path. So let us go to the root text, uh, which you will find on page. There's no page. I don't see any page here. Aja, yeah. Page six, seven, page eight. We'll we'll just read the root text. You got it right. Page eight. It is not marked, but you got page eight. The promise to compose the text, right? Everybody got it? The promise to compose the text. So the text begins by saying, I will explain as well as I can the essence of all the teachings of the conqueror, the path praised by the conqueror's children, the entrance for the fortunate desiring liberation. Promise to compose the text. It is important to make promise in the beginning that I'll do this job nicely and I'll complete this job. That is the gentleman's agreement. <laughs> so, promise to compose the text. The sublime beings, great beings, they never make promises easily. Once they make a promise, they will implement it. They will not break the promise. Promise breakers are better than dog. Worse than dog, sorry. Promise breakers are worse than dog, as, as the saying goes. So this is, I mean, in our regular life also, it's very important. Don't make promises easily. Learn to say no. In fact, I have a book which says, learn to say no. I'm reading that book. <laughs> because it's, you know, and learn to say no, and learn to say no politely. In today's world, it's very important, because people will ask you to come up, go down, you know. This is happening with me also. People come to see me, people ask me to come there, go there, not proper planning, you know. So then, as a kind of uh, human practice of humility and nicety, if you say, yes, I will come, then since this is disorganized, it's just wastage of your time, wastage of other people, things like that, you see. Not necessarily the person who is inviting has a bad motivation, but, but they, are, they, they have not planned things properly. So you, you can do much better not to go there and do something else. You will also experience the same thing in your life. So don't give your nose. Don't give your nose to everybody. <laughs> led by the nose, as we say, like animals, you know. <laughs> don't let yourself led by the nose by everybody in all different kind of directions. Because, as Shantideva says, life is short. There are too many things to know. And we do not know the exact span of our life, how long we are going to live. Therefore, just like the swans extract milk from water, take only those things which is important and necessary. Don't, don't make your brain or mind or head a junkyard. As I said yesterday, no need to get all types of information, not needed. 
As, as, as I said yesterday, if you're thirsty, you need to drink water, not the whole ocean. Not needed. You don't need to know every, everything. If people say, you don't know, then okay, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> this morning, there were some people calling me for an interview, things online. Gishila, can we do it on Telegram? I said, I have no idea what is Telegram. So if you don't know, say no, no problem, you know. Then it's important to learn about it. Otherwise, seek other people's help, you know. You don't have to become an expert on everything. Don't try to do that. But be good in one thing. To be successful in your life, to get a job. Most of us are jack of all. Little bit here, little bit no. That's what I see in the Tibetan society also, you know. A little bit English, a little bit Tibetan, a little bit computer, but no, no expertise. So whether you call it specialization, I don't know this word, I'm not so fond, but specialization is know, knowing everything about nothing, that's what they say. <laughs> so I'm not talking about that kind of specialization, but be very well versed in one thing, so that, number one, you get a good job, and people respect you, that he's the expert on software, he's the expert on hardware, he's the expert on compassion, he's the expert on Buddhism, this and that, you know. We all, all want to get a job, you know. So be good in one thing. Then plus a little bit others which are nece non necessary, but don't try to know everything. No use, not much use. So life is short. There are too many things to know. And we do, 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 not, do not know how long we are going to live. So therefore, just like the swan extracts milk from water, swan, swan is said to have power to, if you put the milk and water together, they have the power to take just the uh, milk and uh, leave the water behind. Different animals have different capacities. It's very interesting, you know, very interesting. Nature has made it like that, right? Many interesting capacities which we don't have, you know, different, different people, different sentient beings, different animals, different birds, they have different capacities, right? So, so here we are primarily talking about not to get expert in one thing to get a job. We are not discussing about that. What I, why I was, I was saying that is in your regular life also you should be good in one thing. That's what I'm saying. Now in here we are primarily talking about as much as possible not to pay too much attention to the useless worldly distractions and pay more attention for your inner development or spiritual practice. These days people prefer using the word spirituality than religion. Unfortunately, religion in many cases has become very divisive, right? So spirituality is also important. I once attended a big international conference in Mexico City. So there I met a gentleman who had written a book on uh, comparing religion and spirituality. According to his research and finding, Spirituality is much, much more beneficial than religion. So there are many things like that. So what I'm saying is, as I said yesterday, we should remember the basic sameness that we all want happiness, do not want suffering. So based on this basic sameness, we need to get those knowledges which uplift, sustain that basic goodness and don't get distracted by those inferior, <laughs> less important, divisive qualities. This is happening actually, slowly, slowly, but it's happening and it has to happen. It is happening. For example, this, these are important, I think. I, I'm not a scholar on that, but I know a little bit, so a little bit I know I am sharing it, okay. <laughs> For example, in the West, earlier there was Western philosophy there was no Western science, right? 
So some of the philosophical part you can call it a science. That's a different thing, but there's no proper science. It's philosophy. Now in the philosophy, there is this talk about metaphysics, the God, existence of God and many other invisible things. So some thinkers came and said, it's all right for you to talk about all these metaphysical things in your philosophy, but for the common masses, it doesn't really make much sense. So let us kick the matter out and leave the word physics, metaphysics. This is how physics came into being. This is how science started. It's very interesting. So that means something physical, something that we can all relate to, understand. Yesterday I spoke about the three objects of knowledge, the obvious phenomena. There's no fun in talking about metaphysical things when you don't pay any attention to the obvious things. Right? Sometimes we are very fond of just you know, drifting into the metaphysical realm, although there, we have no idea, but we are fond of just drifting into that unknown realm, which is not so relevant. So this is how physics came into being. Then physics also, in the beginning, it is probably the, the atomic physics or particle physics, things like that, and gradually that included study of biology, also more or less re related to particles. And then now, some years back, neuroscience also. Neuroscience is the youngest of science. So this is one thing I want to tell you. You, you should explore more about these things. Then, there was a time when the country was ruled by the church or temple, whatever you want to call it. So again, when it is ruled by a religious organization, church or temple, whatever, then they talk about the God again, the metaphysical realm. Then somebody came again. <laughs> he said, okay, I'm not saying you're wrong, but let us, you know, in order to run the country, let us talk about something that everybody can relate to. So then the state came into, from there start the separation of the state and the church. Church, okay, you do all your metaphysical, religious prayers, practices, whatever. But for running the country, we need a separate government, state, separation of state and church. That is what you study in political science. See, again, same kind of development. Now, when the separation of the state and church took place, people are not saying, yes, once you get separated from the church, you don't need any morality, any ethics. They are not saying that. State also, country also, nation also has to have rules, regulations, moral practices. You can't kill, you can't steal. All these things are there. So we need to, to pay more attention to these things. Today what we call as social, emotional, ethical learning or secular ethics. It is enshrined in Indian constitution that India is democratic, secular country. It is there. Secular ethics. That is what we need, universal ethics. There are people who believe in religion. There are people who don't believe in religion. There are big population who are against religion. But all these people need love, need compassion, need this universal ethics. For you personally, okay, you think about God, think about Buddha, and talk about afterlife, all these things. But universally, we should have a system of morality which is applicable to everybody. So that's why since some years, His Holiness the Dalai Lama very strongly encouraged to, to teach secular ethics. He did not say teach Buddhism. For the Buddhists, yes, Buddhism is teaching. 19, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow also he's teaching Buddhism. But for everybody, he's a secular ethics. And I once accompanied him to Brazil. That probably was one of my last travel with him. So he, he said, the buildings are growing taller and taller. Morality is going <laughs> down and down. <laughs> right? So therefore, 
it is important to have this universal secular ethics. Similarly, the separation of spirituality and religion. Religion, with due respect, many good things are there, but many, as I said, conflicts and divisions have taken place. So people are now talking about spirituality, something to do with your basic spirit, not just believing in an a external agent force. Right? So these are, I wanted to, as I said, I'm not an expert on it, on it but I, I'm fond of reading many, many things. <laughs> This, this morning I was reading a book on how war come into being. <laughs> Recently I bought a lot of books from Delhi. <laughs> One of the interesting book, book was how the war started. And then the book says the war did not, the war and conflict did not, did, it is not started by human beings. We have inherited from our primates. <laughs> and one of these person who is really advocating that is uh, a, a very good expert who lives in Atlanta, and I met him some years back. So anyway, the point that I'm making is, we should really, number one, understand our basic sameness. This is high time that we should promote that basic sameness. And develop this feeling whenever you see anybody, whether you speak that language or not, whenever you see anybody, you should think, oh, another human being. Don't say, oh, Indian, oh, Tibetan, oh, Chinese, oh, American, not like that. Don't, don't make that distance, right? Same, same human being. If you smile, they will also smile. <laughs> if you hit, they will also hit you back, <laughs> right? So therefore, I think it's, it's high time that we, we need this universal ethics. And there, therefore, in Buddhism also, what is, Buddhism is basically for Buddhist. <coughs> His Holiness the Dalai Lama went to the extent of making three divisions in the Buddhist teaching. He went to that extent and he was so concerned about helping everybody. He said, let us divide the Buddha's teaching into three sections. Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist science. And he said, Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist science is for everybody. Let us make it available. And he, he, he invited a group of monk scholars and made them compile, you know, look at the Buddha's teaching and other Indian commentaries and take out that Buddhist philosophical part and Buddhist science part and make it available. First, first four, five, six books have been published in Tibetan. Now it's already published and translated in English. Also, four volumes are there. Buddhist science, Buddhist physics, you know, Buddhist philosophy, things like that for everybody. He said, we must benefit everybody. Then he said, Buddhism is for Buddhists. It's none of your business. <laughs> He's saying something like that, you know, right? So it's really important to, to, to develop the sameness, sameness. We are born in the same way, we'll die in the same way. Then why, why so much hustle in between? <laughs> why so much division in between? And in between also, we become sick in the same way. Whether you're a rich person or not rich, you know, we all get sick, we all age, we all have differences, we have all experience ups and downs, we are same. So by understanding this universality, this sameness, we must become <coughs> cohesive and learn to live harmoniously. And then don't, don't encourage fanaticism, fundamentalism, you know, sectarianism, I think it's not good at all, not good at all, because innocent people are killed, unfortunately, normally. When there's a bombardment or shooting of ballistic missiles or even a street fight, mostly it is ordinary people who are killed. The politicians and the leaders who are on the high pedestal, even if there's a world war, they will not die. They all have prepared bunkers for themselves. Impenetrable bunkers they have prepared. It's you and I who will die. So therefore we should not, we should learn to say no to conflict and war and discrimination. Right? Does it make sense? Because life is short. Why don't you enjoy this short life? <laughs> 
be happy, enjoy this short life, help each other, share your good, you know, your expertise, your wisdom, enrich each other, you know. That, that's how we can all fare well in this sometimes turbulent journey. So that's the purpose of the Buddhist teaching. So therefore, in the beginning, the very beginning, the promise to compose the text, as I explained, that itself says that in terms of doing these good things, I'm, I'm going to write it with this very important text, and I'm going to complete it. I'm determined. He has not written this for his PhD thesis. Right? To have it published in a reputed journal. <laughs> he had written this at the he received first of all the blessing and direct teaching from Manjushri, as I said. And then according to his teaching, he wrote this text, Tsongkhapa. So let me explain a little bit about who is this Manjushri, the celestial deity, and Tsongkhapa. Right? I'll, I'll read just a little bit. Manjushri. Manjushri, literally Manjushri means one who has soft speech. Soft speech. I mean, that itself is really amazing. Soft speech. In Buddhism, it, you are encouraged to speak softly. When you speak, your words should be sweet like honey. If not, should be like flowers. It should not be like a shit. <laughs> right? Or dirt. Because the as I mentioned yesterday, we have this very important sophisticated language which can do miracles, but it can also kill people. You the words or the language that you use may not be physical and sharp like a blade. But when you misuse it, it can chop other people's heart into pieces. For example, if you call somebody who has both eyes intact, you're blind, you can't see, it's horrible. He's not blind. And if you say the same thing to somebody who is blind, it's like trampling on the person who is already fallen, you see. It's touching the wound. So be very careful. As much as possible, speak a little bit less. Somebody yesterday asked, is, well, what good is there in remaining silent? Many, many good things. When you remain silent, you can, your listening power increases. Your meditation power increases. And you, 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 can, you can receive wisdoms from other people. If you keep on talking, like me, talking, talking, I may not get anything from you. If I listen to you, I will get all the wisdoms, see, right? Right? So, speech is very important. So, Manjushri is somebody who has full control over his body, speech, and mind. Therefore, his speech is also soft and kind and gentle. So, Manjushri, a celestial being. So Manjushri means smooth, whose, whose language is smooth, glorious, melodious. And he is said to be the embodiment of all the Buddha's infinite wisdom. All the attributes of Manjushri point to the wisdom that he personifies. If you look at Manjushri's statue or painting, you will see him one hand holding a double-edged sword. That sword is not to go to battlefield and kill somebody, but that sword symbolizes wisdom, realizing emptiness. It is by the wisdom realizing emptiness, you can cut and uproot ignorance. Then similarly, this double-edged sword cuts through obscuring layers of misconceptions and discriminates accurately between the interdependent way things mistakenly appear to exist and the interdependent way they actually do exist. Then his other hand holds a scripture, the perfection of Wisdom Sutra. 
treasured as Buddha's most profound statement on the ultimate nature of reality, which talks about shunyata or emptiness, is a further indication that Manjushri's penetrating insight is of the highest order. It is said that the two most powerful ways of developing wisdom oneself are to study those profound sutras and to meditate upon Manjushri. Study. Therefore, in Buddhism, study is very, very important. Find things by yourself, not just listening to somebody. Faith is important. Devotion is important, but no room for blind faith. But ordinarily, people don't study, so they, maintain, they continue to maintain blind faith. And I've been telling my Tibetan friends that uh, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama is suggesting, please study. But majority of the people don't study. They have blind faith. Then I tease them by saying, you're lucky because the religion in, in which you have blind faith turned out to be a good one. <laughs> Ima imagine if that religion towards which you maintain blind faith it turn turns out to be bad because there are many wrong philosophies, wrong teachings, everywhere, you see. So if you, you know, just follow it, you will go into the, the wrong place, right? So faith is important. But faith is not blind faith, but faith based on reason, understanding, study, right? Buddhist texts talk about three types of faith. The first faith is called Clear faith. Clear faith. Clear faith means clear faith should also be based on knowledge. And based on knowledge, when you develop a clear faith, clear faith means your mind becomes very clear, very pure. And the example given in the in the text is just like a lustful person seeing a beautiful woman. When a lustful person <laughs> sees a beautiful man, his mind is completely clear about that woman. So like that, towards the teaching, towards the, the qualified teacher, you should have this clear faith and trust. Just as your mind goes towards that beautiful woman or handsome man. That's called clear faith. Second is called Trusting faith, trusting faith. Best once, once through reasoning, logical understanding, when you develop the, the object of your faith as reliable, then you should trust it. It is good not to trust everybody. It is also bad not to trust anyone. <laughs> right? So somewhere you have to trust. And that trust must come based on your study, knowledge, and reflection. So trusting faith, the example is like a, like a little innocent child's trust to her mother. For the little child, he thinks and believes, my mother can do miracles. My mother can solve all my problems. Which may not be true, but to, to that child, she, she does solve all problems. Amazing. And why, why this mother is able to solve all the problems? Not necessarily because she's highly qualified or educated, things like that. All mothers are great. The primary factor that they are able to solve many of the child's pro problem is that unconditional love. Amazing. Right? So trusting faith. The third type of faith is called aspiring faith. Aspiring. It's not enough to have clear faith and trusting faith. You should yourself try to become that, that object, the Buddha. Aspire. Buddha was also, according to Buddhist teaching, Buddha was also like you and me. He was not right from the beginning, enlightened being. He was just a prince of a king. So read, read his life story also. He was, he was a prince. He was a... Of course, there are many, many versions, but ordinarily it is said that he is a prince. And he has all the luxuries at his disposal. Different seasons, he has different palaces. He has different swimming pools around, you know, even at those days. And he was uh, entertained by very beautifully looking women around. Singers, dancers, right? All those things were there as a prince. 
But somehow he, he always like was curious. What must be there beyond this gate? For me, this is metaphorically very, very important. What is beyond this, this gate? So we should also grin our neck and look what is beyond what is being shown to you right now. All this not just what is there <laughs> at your feet. <laughs> it's much, much bigger. So he was always wondering, curious to go out. So one day he, and the father was already a prophecy was made to the king by saying that if you keep this, your prince, in the kingdom itself, and uh, don't show him the luxury, the, the ugly sights, then it's sure he will become a great monarch who can follow the footsteps of his father, the king, right? Now, if you let this child go out and then he will become a, a bodhisattva, a Buddha, that prophecy was there. So the king was really worried. He was not so interested about his son becoming a Buddha, but he was interested in making his prince as his, you know, caretaker of his kingdom here, as we say. So he made it sure that his, the prince is guarded from all sides and that there, there is entertainment, everything there. But somehow he ventured out. And when he ventured out, he, he saw what we call as the four sides. Even when he ventured out, I think with the permission of the king, the king said, decorate, whichever way he goes, decorate all those things so nicely that he doesn't see the ugly side. I mean, this, is, this story is so interesting. Like, 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 for example, today when the president and prime minister goes out, then that route is very nicely prepared, you see. They, never, they are never shown the, the poor area, the ugly side, you see. And this, this president, prime minister, others, I mean, I'm not saying I can't just put them all in one basket, but most of them just follow the protocol. Not, not many people who just venture out and say, I want to really go and mix with the people and see them, right? So that was happening there. So anyway, in his journey, he saw old men, you know, with shaky hands and uh, uh, unsteady legs, whatever. He said, what is this? He's behaving very strangely. What is, what is this? He said, He's, this is called elderly person, old man. The, the charioteer who took him around, he said, you will also become like this. I will also become like this. He said, what? I'm also, become, I'm also going to become like this old man. <laughs> In fact, there is a, a Tibetan master has written a dialogue between an old, old person and a young child, you know. I've translated this into English, so anybody interested, you can read it. This young person makes fun of this old man, you know. So then he gives a, you know, very befitting teaching. So anyway, then he also sees a sick person. Then also sees a dead person. And then finally he sees a monk who looked very calm and controlled and peaceful. So from, from by seeing this at an ordinary level, although we believe he's already enlightened, but at an ordinary level, he had shown us the path to, to actually see what is happening around and then find the way to liberation or enlightenment or a more peaceful, harmonious state, right? So we see all these things. All the time we see, but we become immune to these things. Marra marnedo, Buddha hora honedo. We don't pay much attention. So what I'm saying is, for, since we are the follower of the Buddha's teaching, we should pay serious attention to these things. When you see somebody dying, you should not only feel sorry, but you should see, next may be my turn. Next may be my turn. There is a story of uh, one, one gentleman <coughs> who was at the marketplace getting distracted and uh, you know, looking at things like that. And then somebody tapped him from the <laughs> behind the shoulder. Somebody tapped him and he looked back and found that messenger of death was standing there. He was horrified. 
He said, what are you doing here? I said, no, 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 I, 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 I'm not here to pick you up this time. Your turn is next Monday. <laughs> right, right now I'm looking for someone else. So he said, next Monday, oh, still more, almost there one week, so I should protect myself. He just ran away, left the marketplace and the town, city, whatever, and went into the mountain and hid himself for one week in a cave. Nobody came. She thought, okay, I, I managed to escape. So on the last day, the Monday morning, <laughs> he just craned, out, craned his neck and came out from the cave and stretched his hand and said, oh, okay. He couldn't find me here. This is a very secure place. Just looking around. Then somebody again tapped <laughs> from the behind. <laughs> then he expressed his shock and he said, how did you figure out that I'm here? He said, don't be shocked. I'm more shocked than you. <laughs> because the, the Lord, the, the Lord of the death told me to pick you from here, but I saw you in the marketplace last time. <laughs> <laughs> so so, the, so the, the story is, that you will be picked up from wherever. There's no place to hide. There is no place to hide. People may die in the bunker also. You see? No way to hide. I'll tell you a second story. <laughs> the second story is a story of a human being who made a friendship with a ghost. So that ghost is said to have some kind of precognition, clairvoyance. So the human being said, just like he's, let us say he's our representative. <laughs> so he said, I'm a little bit scared of death, but I also want to have fun in my life. That's what we all say, right? I also want to have some fun in my life. So I really want to enjoy my life. But when I'm about to die, since you have clear wines, you tell me a little bit in advance, then I'll do my spiritual practice. <laughs> the ghost said, okay, fine, sure. So one day the ghost came and said, my dear friend, one mem member of the family down there died last night. He said, is it so? So sorry, so sorry. Om Mani Padme Hum, whatever, you know, mantra and prayer, whatever he says, so sorry, so sorry. But he, but he never thought that next day is done. He went on, enjoying. Then again, after some time, the ghost came and said, my dear friend, one of the family member up there died last night. He said, is that so? So sorry. But he went on his usual way, enjoying, the so-called enjoying. And one day the ghost came and said, my dear friend, it's your turn to go. He said, what? I told you to tell me a little bit in advance. <laughs> the ghost said, I've never seen a stupid person like you. I told you two times. The member of the family down there died, the member of the family up there died. When I told you, it should have occurred to you that your turn will come any time. So this is exactly what is happening with all of us. Now these days, you know, death of people you hear almost all the time. Open a news, newspaper, there is a section, obituary. Then, then do you see people dying in your neighborhood? But you think, I, I'll live. Uh, they are dying, I'm going to live. I'm okay. So it's not good to make very strong friendship with okay. <laughs> Death is definite. Can you challenge that? Death is definite. Time of death is indefinite. In the modern world, we are very good in making appointments, you know. 3 o'clock, I'm meeting somebody. 10 o'clock, I'm meeting somebody. I help to do that also. But death will never seek your appointment. Right? Then if you're not prepared, mentally not, if you're mentally prepared, there's nothing to, to be shocked or no reason to have fear. When you are not prepared, and when you have so much of this attachment to your friends, to your relatives, to wealth, to name and fame, you will get shocked because death is like the sum of your life. It's very intense. So therefore, the preparation of the death must be there in our daily life. And it is actually this understanding of impermanence and death which will really jolt you, which will really activate you to do Dharma practice. 
Because then you see the futility of many things that you thought is very, very important. Right? So therefore, the first teaching that the Buddha gave us on impermanence, the first teaching, believe me, after he got enlightened, he was requested to give the teaching, he did not accept. He's not like one of those, these modern teachers who just volunteer and say, I'm going to give a teaching. Please come, bring your money. Uh, I'll, I'll make you achieve enlightenment in one week. In the West, there are, I'm not exaggerating, there are people who say that, enlightenment in one week. And people, there are people who think it will happen and go there. Nothing will happen. <laughs> Right? So therefore, he did not accept. He, did, he was requested a few times. He did not accept. The reason he did not accept to teach right away is number one, in those days, I think he never gave teachings receiving money or you know, collecting chanda, as we call it. They are new, nice names, chanda. <laughs> Basically means money. <laughs> so, that was number one. Second, he's not interested in having many disciples. He's interested in helping them, but he, he's not interested in having many, many people around him. He even gave up his kingdom, everything that was there at his disposal. So he did not write away, give the teaching for many reasons. One reason is, that is saying, if you, are you sure you really want to come to attend the teaching? Or is, he was saying, are you sure you want to attend the teaching? Are you serious? Are you going to listen properly? Are you going to concentrate and pay attention? Then it will be useful. Otherwise, it will not be useful. It will be another display of worldly activities. That's what he wanted to say. Second. What he found was really profound. So take it seriously. And in fact, when he refused to give the teaching right away, he said, I found a teaching, a wisdom which is like nectar, which is profound, which is peaceful, which is free from fabrication, which is clear light, which is unconditioned. To whomever I teach it, nobody will understand it. Therefore, leave me alone. Let me continue my meditation. And honestly speaking, what he found was very profound. So if you really want to understand those profound teachings, which we normally don't understand, then there must be some dedication, some concentration, some patience, some seriousness. Otherwise, you will not understand it. That's what he said. And then finally, after many, many requests by the celestial beings and uh, human beings, and finally, when he accepted the teaching, then the first teaching that he gave was the teaching on the Four Noble Truths. Truth of suffering. Again here, It is time, as a prince, he has the, the luxury and time to go around to see how people are living their life. He saw farmers, for example, cultivating their land, growing some crops this year. It may be successful, it may not be successful. There may be hell, there may be storm, there may be rain, or it may be a good, good crop. Anyway, there's the story of this, life, this day, this year. Next year also they'll do the same thing. Next year also they'll do the same thing. That is called, I think the concept of cyclic existence came from there, probably. Now of course it has a much, much deeper meaning. But the original idea, probably he came, it came from there. So, so look at now with us, cyclic existence. We do the same thing, recycling, same thing, again and again. We don't know better. We use the same negative emotion 
you know, we want happiness, but as Shanti Deva said, <laughs> we want happiness, but because of ignorance, we destroy the causes of our happiness as if it is our enemy. And we have this wish to shun suffering, but we chase suffering. We chase after the sources of suffering because of ignorance again. Right? So therefore, on this ordinary level of people's life, he saw two things very clearly. People are running hither and thither looking for happiness and not getting enough. Certainly not getting the long-lasting happiness. Ephemeral happiness, they are getting a little bit here and there, not much. And it was also very clear to him that people don't want suffering. There's enough suffering still, aging, sickness, death, you know, and then separation from near and dear ones. Those people who you want to meet, very difficult to meet them. Even if you make a phone call, they are not picking it up. Those people you don't want to meet, they seem to be standing at the corner waiting for you all the time. <laughs> and you're looking for a job, you're not getting it, you know. Things like that, a lot of problems. Four types of problems, six types of problems, you know, so many problems, difficulties, there are countless problems are there, right? So he saw people have all kinds of problems. And he saw clearly people want happiness, don't want suffering, but not many of them are thinking and questioning what are the causes of happiness, what are the causes of suffering? And he said if people don't want suffering, why don't they find the causes of suffering and see whether they can dislodge it or not, remove it or not? If they want happiness, why don't they look for the cause, the source from which happiness is coming? Why don't they cultivate it, <laughs> nurture it? This is what he taught. Suffering, it is cause. Happiness, it is cause. Now suffering, many types. One is called suffering of suffering. That means obvious suffering, like headache, diarrhea, right? Which is obvious suffering. We all know, animals also know that suffering. Second is called suffering of change, which we don't know that is suffering. For example, right now you are sitting here nicely, it's for two hours, not bad, right? So it looks okay. But now if I become a little bit adamant and say, you know, Buddhist practice, doing Buddhist practice is very rare. You may need to come to Dharamsala again and again. So let us devote more time. Two hours, this is nothing. Let us skip the lunch. And if I keep on talking, two hours, three hours, four hours, <laughs> it will be, you know, if you, know, you have this beautiful you know, video camera, if you shoot it and see the, you know, the, the, the people's face, they, they, you will see them getting restless, you know. Some, baby, some people may say, I want to go to the bathroom, you know, whatever, you know. Gradually, they'll, they'll go away. Gradually, the, the people will go away. Because their, your notion of happiness, which you got earlier, gradually changes into suffering. In economics, it is called law of marginal utility. If you're hungry, one loaf of bread is good, second maybe also good, but how much you can eat? If you stop yourself, eat more and more, then vomiting will be there. <laughs> right? So on a larger scale, this is our relation with other people is also basically rooted in suffering of change. There may be one person who you take it as your hand and glove friend, very dear friend, just like one person, as we say, but gradually things change, and that person becomes your sworn enemy. That person refuses to talk to you, refuses to meet you. Change, you see. So, so the point is, we can't get a long-lasting happiness by this unreliable changing situations. So that's also suffering. Then there is a third level of suffering, which is much more subtle, which we don't pay attention. It's conditioned suffering. 
pervasive conditioned suffering. That means it, it's our very existence. We have this suffering of suffering. We have this suffering of change because we are conditioned. We are controlled by contaminated co actions and negative emotions. Right? So long as you are under the control of negative emotions and the wrong actions, you can never be happy in the true sense of the term. As I mentioned earlier repeatedly that our enemy is negative emotion. The target of Buddhist practice is to dislodge and to at least reduce the strength of these negative emotions. So again we are coming to the same point. Right? So you need to make a conclusive determination, conviction, saying that so long as I'm under the control of the negative emotions, I will never be happy, so I will reduce, start reducing my negative emotions. And when you, when you reduce your negative emotions, then suffering of change will also not be there. Suffering of suffering will also not be there. It's really amazing. When you change your mind, your biology also changes. So, so as I said yesterday, therefore your mind can make miracles. Right? So therefore, the first teaching that the Buddha gave us on the Four Noble Truths, true suffering, as I said, True suffering means there are many suffering, but basically three suffering of suffering, suffering of change, conditioned suffering. True suffering. Now, this suffering comes from true origin of suffering, source of suffering, true causes of suffering. Causes are not outside, it's in you. Negative emotions are within you, wrong actions are within you, and you engage in the wrong physical, mental, verbal actions because of negative emotions within yourself, right? So they are the origin. So if you want to get rid of suffering, reduce your negative emotions. Then third, the, the important, more important question is, okay, we have true suffering, we have true origin of suffering, but is it possible to remove? We may be able to remove, we may be able to reduce the intensity of these negative emotions, but is it possible to completely eradicate them, uproot them? That's the key question. According to Buddhist teaching, it says yes. But whether you will be able to do or not is dependent upon how hard you work. But, but the good news is you can certainly become much more happier. You can, you can reduce the intensity of this, many of these negative emotions. That itself is good enough for us. Right? So therefore, the third noble truth is called true cessation, which is other, than, other name for nirvana, liberation. When you have met all these negative emotions cease, when you have removed them, that is called nirvana, state of peace. That state of nirvana, cessation, peace is possible because there is a path. The fourth is true path. The path is path of wisdom, path of compassion. Part of the three principal aspects of the path that we are going to read here. Right? So therefore, this text, as you have already read, the first first verse. I will explain as well as I can. The essence of all the teachings of the con conqueror. Conqu conqueror means victor. Sometimes we use conqueror, some of sometimes we use victor. This refers, this is an epithet to the Buddha. Buddha is somebody who had controlled, conquered all the negative emotions. Right? So, I will explain as well as I can. I will explain three things. Basically, he is saying, I will explain three things. Renunciation, bodhicitta, and shunyata. Or the wisdom understanding shunyata. I will explain these three things. Because these three things are the essence of all the teachings of the Buddha. I mean, you can read the books and books, books and books, as I said, but if you summarize it, if you want to really catch the essence, the heart, it is included in these three. 
practice of renunciation is the essence of the teachings of the Buddha. Practice of bodhicitta is the essence of all the teachings of the Buddha. Practice of wisdom understanding, emptiness is the essence of all the teachings of the Buddha. So the path praised by the conqueror's children. Conqueror's children means the bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas. Buddhas and bodhisattvas. The Buddha is somebody who is said to be completely enlightened. And bodhisattvas are those who have developed altruistic attitude, meaning that I will also become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. So those are called bodhisattvas. Sattva means mind. Bodhi means enlightenment. One who has this mind towards enlightenment. Right? So th for this bodhisattvas, the practitioners also, these three are the most important thing. The path of renunciation, path of bodhicitta, and path of wisdom, understanding, emptiness. The entrance for the fortunate desiring liberation. So these three are also uh, the gateway for the fortunate desiring complete liberation or enlightenment. Right? So, they, so this is explained with reference to all the three. All the three. Clear? Now, what is renunciation? In order to understand the renunciation, you need to know a few things. One, you need to clearly know the preciousness of this human life, which is very rare to get again and again. I'm not going to go into detail. And then second is the faults of the cyclic existence. We already discussed three types of suffering, right? So there are, there are many limitations within this samsara, right? Like for example, if you look at your own body, it is very fragile. However much we decorate it and then polish it and clean it, but still, you know, it's fragile. Right? Very fragile. <laughs> I was once reading a magazine when I was flying from uh, US to Germany. So that article in that magazine spoke about the modern packaging system. <laughs> so in that, that magazine, you know, ex explained about the modern packaging system. According to the modern packaging system, whatever is fragile is packed nicely inside and then wrapped with something much more stronger to protect it. Then on top of it, a word is written words are written, fragile, handle carefully. So now look at ourselves. All the fragile parts are put, packed nicely inside. The intestines, the, the lungs, the kidneys, whatever, internal organs, very, very fragile ones put inside. Then they are encased in that rib cage, things like that, then plastered with <laughs> flesh and skin, right? And then the outside looks okay. Because of this, as I mentioned yesterday, the discrepancy between appearance and reality, we go after appearance, just the skin deep. Beauty is skin deep. As somebody wrote clearly, beauty is skin deep, ugly goes all the way down. When, you, when I use the word ugly, it's not a disparaging word, it's this, a similar thing. Nobody wants to see the blood. Nobody, nobody wants to see the kidney out and things like that. So that, 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 those are things. So the point that I'm making is, even if you look at your own body, you can clearly see. That's why on the first day I said you must study who is a human being, what it is made of. I have a very interesting book. Now I forgot. It's all about human, you know, uh, human being. And in that book, it says, as far as these external physical things are concerned, you can basically buy all of these things in a market, except some rare portions. Most of you can buy in 
at that time when he was writing the book, I think it was like, uh, I don't remember exactly, like 5,000 pounds or something like that. You can buy all of them. Somehow you cannot make a human being just buy this product. So that is the interesting part. So anyway, the, look at the physical body itself. It is very fragile. This also we need to know because in Buddhism we say you must understand impermanence of your body, your mind, your speech, everything. This is not to frighten. Talk about death. This is not to frighten you, but to, you know, make you aware about the reality and accordingly take care of yourself. Because the more you know your fragility, the more you should take care, just as you take care of your fragile watch. I mean, it's so, you know, crazy, kind of crazy, you know. With the external things, money, and the gold jewelry, we put them in the safe case and we take so much care about it. But about oneself, we don't take much care. Right? So sometimes I jokingly tell people that when you go to the airport, you should put a play card. Fragile, handle me carefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the boxes and objects that you send in the cargo. The, the person who is traveling is also very fragile. You know, your emotion is very sensitive and fragile. Your internal organs are fragile. <laughs> you need to be very, very careful. Very careful. So, so it makes complete sense. The more you understand your fragility, the more you should take care of your body. Which means you can't throw everything sweet, salty, whatever, into the mouth thinking everything will be okay. No, not okay. Even on that very basic level, unfortunately, most of us don't know how to take care of ourselves. Right? We only put ornaments on the face and the hair, which is visible to others. And those things which, are, which really matters, which people don't see, you don't take care. You just throw everything. And today, junk food. So here also, I'm tempted to say, I mean, you, you actually, I should not uh, probably mean commenting. You may know much better than me in terms of health and things like that. But you may know, but you may not be practicing. So what I'm saying is we should all practice, say no to junk food. If you want to have clean environment, let us start from those simple things. And junk food means those food which has a lot of salt and a lot of sugar and packaged foods. We're all drinking from the bottled water. And where does this bottle go? The plastic go? I raised my concern about this in a big conference in New Delhi, where over, over 200, 200, 300 people came there. They were all giving like fairy speeches about the need to protect environment, things like that. Everybody has a water bottle in front of their table. I said, what are you talking about? They did not give me a chance to, I was not one of the speakers, but I seized the opportunity asking questions. Things. At that time, I said, I don't care if you get hurt, you know. People are just not practicing. Where does this plastic go? And this is just one small example. There are so many things, wrappings that we use with this packaged food, you know, where, where do, do they go? Then all these Coca-Colas and all these soft and hard drinks, you know. <laughs> In Atlanta University, they did an experiment with what kind of drinks are more good for the body. Coca-Cola, Limca, whatever, all those things, plus water. They found water best. <laughs> and we are paying to let others, we are paying others to let them kill us. As simple as that. That, that is our intelligence, you see. So here, here I'm not just talking, you know. I don't drink Coca-Cola. I, I did not make a the vow or took an oath. Maybe just one sip somewhere, I don't know. But normally I don't. Right? 
So I think if you really want to change the world, then make sure that you don't turn this, this earth as a place for garbages. The other day I was watching somewhere in Kuwait or somewhere, you know, this uh, rubber wheels which is used and then later on of no much benefit. It's sold into those countries to dump it or whatever. The amount of those rubber wheels there, it was almost like a valley full of those things. And they have no idea how to clean it. They tried to do it, then the pollution that came from there is just amazing. You see? Right? So there are so many things. Before we talk about Nirvana enlightenment, there's so many things we need to do. Right? So, so the talking is not much useful. <coughs> Practicing, gaining more knowledge. Because right now you are, people are saying that, okay, if you don't drink from the bottled water, water is polluted. Then you believe it, you know. We are very, what, what do we say? Uh, say? We are very plausible. You know, we listen to whatever it comes in the newspaper and things like that and take it for, you know, granted that this is true. Right? So therefore, uh, I wanted to say something for good. Oh, okay, so... Renunciation, I was talking about the, the first principal aspects of the path is renunciation. Renunciation means you see those things which is irrelevant, useless, harmful, try to get rid of it. That's what he's saying basically. In other words, you see your own limitation as I said. If you just look at the body, there's really not much essence. But this does not mean to say you are useless, you are not important. The Buddhist teachings say, yes, you are very important. You have this very fragile body, but you, you have this capacity to become the Buddha. In terms of your mental potential and energy, you have this capacity to help so many people. Just one person can make many people's life very, very happy. So therefore, you should not get lost just pampering and looking after the body and in, in, you know, ignoring completely the needs of the mind. So empower the mind, enrich the mind. And don't waste your time with those things that we see in the samsara, many useless things. Don't get engrossed with that. Do this more important project. So that is what he's saying, renunciation. Renunciation is not saying that you throw away everything, become a beggar <laughs> overnight, no. So yesterday I mentioned about this great name of this great teacher, Milarepa, right? So there was a fellow living at the time of Milarepa. He was very inspired by this dedication and the spiritual practice of Milarepa. So he was very encouraging and he said, yeah, I also want to practice like Milarepa. But he mis misunderstood the meaning of renunciation and he threw away all his belongings. Overnight he made himself a pauper, a beggar. That is easy. Not easy, but it is easy. Relatively easy to throw away things. Right? But because his mind was not ready, in two, three days he started suffering. You know, I need this, I don't have this, I need this cloth, I need this thing, I don't have it. He started suffering so much, then he said, this Milareva, not only he is a beggar, he also made me a beggar. <laughs> so we'll, we'll only become a beggar. That's not what the Buddha is teaching. Buddha has always taught the middle way. Don't lead a life of luxury and also don't lead a life of poverty. Middle way. It's very, very important in terms of world economical health also, you know. Middle way. There should be contentment also. 
How much is how much? How much you need, really? So it's not saying that you, you can't live in a room, you can't wear good clothes, you can't keep your body warm. It's not saying that. Use all those things which is really necessary. But don't go beyond it. Don't pamper yourself. Don't get addicted. This will lead to big problem. Because the more you want, the more you have to work like a donkey. And many people who are after money and wealth, they actually live like a donkey. They don't even sleep properly. They work and work just to be called he's the richest man. Right? And then they have the same stomach, not bigger than us, can't eat more. I had some of the rich people, they have so much social gathering. They go to one place, have this party, have lunch, then go to another party, the similar lunch. They can't eat, go to the bathroom, vomit, and then go to the party. People can go to such an extent of madness. These are all madness. Just to show that so-called image, you know. And you wear 10 gold rings on 10 fingers. Doesn't look beautiful. Doesn't look nice. Right? And, and actually, honestly speaking, the more you have, the more the taxpayers are, the t you know, tax people are after you these days. It's actually not your money now. It can be taken any time in, in any name. Happening, you see? Right? <laughs> so there, there's, a, there's a teaching in, in one, one text which says, if you carry a heavy load, then the thieves are watching you. And that's why in many countries you are not advised to count your money in front of many people because there are many poor people and you know robbers and thieves watching you. You know they'll chase you and cut your neck and pull the gold chain. It may happen. It may gold, gold chain from your neck from tearing your <laughs> your ear lobe. <laughs> Things like that, you see. So I'm not saying that you lead a life of, you know, poverty. But you also need to take care, good care of your health, take good food, wear good clothes, okay, certain amount of money also you need. There's no problem with that. But don't get addicted to those things. Don't start thinking these are most important things in my life. My gold chain is the most important thing in my life, no. I've seen people who cherish a gold, you know, ring or whatever, very important, they put it in a very safe box, never, never wear it. It's lying in the store. So what, 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 what is the use of that? <laughs> you can't use it. One day I will use it. These days people have like 20 pairs of shoes, thinking that I need this for jogging, I need this for mountain climbing. I need this when I go to bathroom, otherwise I will sleep and die. <laughs> yeah? There is, there is, I'm not again trying to turn the clock back. There may there be an element of truth, but not completely true, you know. You have only two, two feet, so you, you, may be, you may need a few pairs, but not so much. And it is because of this greed, you keep on storing your shoes, you keep on storing, you know, shirt and pants, so many things. Your, House is completely stuffed by all these things that you've collected from the market. And you will find, to your great dismay, many of these that once you cherished, you have never used it for the last 10, 20 years. Still thinking, one day I will use it. When this is your situation, there are many people who are dying to, to have what you have, which you are not using. So why don't you take the courage, pull the courage, and give some of this to those people who are dying to have that. Your life will be also simpler, cleaner, easier, right? So there are many things, practical things that you need to do before we talk about big things. So renunciation. Then bodhicitta, as I said, bodhi means enlightenment. Chit means mind. So bodhicitta means the mind to enlightenment. Altruistic intention to become enlightenment. So the definition of bodhicitta, this is very important to remember this name, bodhicitta. Having come to Dharamsala, if you know what it, mean, what it means, 
the meaning of renunciation, the meaning of bodhicitta, the meaning of wisdom, understanding, shunyata, you are successful. Because these things you can't buy in any market. Nobody is going to teach you these things in today's world. In, in only very few places you can get these teachings. And these teachings will be your most important treasure for the rest of your life. So bodhicitta means wish to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Look at this. Wish to become Buddha, not for your family, not for your nation alone. The wish to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And why you want to become Buddha? And who is Buddha? Buddha is somebody who is completely enlightened, who is without suffering, without problem, completely enlightened. Now whether it is possible to, to, have, to reach such a state, it's, it's again not easy. We need to spend more time to think about it, right? Not easy. Given the intensity of our negative emotions, it's almost impossible thing that we are talking about. But again, the good news is that we can all experience and know that if you make the effort, you can reduce the intensity of many of your negative emotions. So that is actually walking towards that state of Buddhahood. Right? Right? That's the good news. Otherwise, you talk about liberation, enlightenment, you know, if you don't think about how you can begin from here, how it is impacting your life here, it will make no sense. You will start thinking, okay, I give up, impossible for me. Don't give up because you can change from now. You can smile a little bit more than before. You can get less angry than before. You can become more patient than before. All this, that is the way. So it's not so much about perfection, but it is about the change that you can bring about and make your life happier and other people's life happier. Right? That's important. So bodhicitta means the wish to become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. Now, who is Buddha? Buddha is somebody who has removed all everything that has to be removed and who has developed all the qualities that needs to be developed. That is Buddha. And who is said to be omniscient. Or if you have difficulty understanding that, understanding that, you should understand Buddha as somebody who is really very, very wise and very, very experienced. So somebody who is very wise and full of experience can show a good path to others. Right? And moreover, it is said the Buddha can read your mind. That also not easy for us to believe, but to some extent, again, we start from the very beginning level. Depending upon your experience, you can also read other people's mind a little bit. As we say, face is the index of human mind. Right? So you can just look at other people's face and find out what this person is thinking. Why, why she is getting restless with her hand, where she is putting her hand, on what area of the body. You can study all this and figure out whether that person is fidgeting, restless, happy, not happy. You can figure out all those things. It is a question of studying a little bit more. So Buddha is somebody who is said to know all these things. Because the, the Buddha is able to, to read other people's mind, he knows what teaching is good for this person, what teaching is not good for this person, what teaching is good for this person for the long run. For example, there was a time when this Ajat king, Ajat Shatru, he killed his father, king, who was also a king. At the advice of one of his very negative friends, he killed his father. <coughs> Petricide, as we call it. And he had also heard killing one's father is a very heinous crime, very negative crime. So after having killed the father, he sank into depression and did not know how to solve that problem, how to come out from that depression. And then somebody said, the best person who can guide you is Buddha, go to him. So he went to Buddha, 
and said, this is what I did. I killed my father. So can you please show me the path to purify myself? Then the Buddha said, what? So what? Father is to be killed. You didn't do anything wrong. Father is to be killed. Mother is to be killed. And the whole city has to be destroyed, should be destroyed. That's what you have done. <laughs> because he had trust to the Buddha, he thought what I did was good. <laughs> he, he came out of the depression. When he came out of the depression, then the Buddha said, OK, listen. <laughs> listen what I've told you. When I said father and mother to, to be killed, I'm not talking about killing your physical father and mother. I'm talking about killing ignorance and negative karma, karma which produces all the host of like city-like <laughs> negative emotions. That's the way to purify yourself. So very tactful. So that's why if you read the Buddha's teaching, there are two levels of teaching. One is called interpretative teaching. Second is called definitive teaching. Interpretative teaching means depending upon your mental level, your mental readiness, you have to give a level of teaching which people can relate to, which people can understand. Right? And then gradually you lead to the higher path. You cannot right away give, give many profound teachings if they are not ready. So you need to be very, very skillful. Right? So therefore, not only Buddha, but if, if somebody has more experience, he can show you a better path. Just by exchanging few words, you know okay, what is happening with this person. You can address it. So therefore, study knowledge. And then hopefully, one day become Buddha, then you can really guide people. Otherwise, so the motivation, the reason to become Buddha is so that you can really help in the true sense of the term, people, to help people. Because the best way of helping people is not giving money. Yes, it is important to practice giving and charity. Yes, it is important to practice patience, all those things. Right? But if you really want to help people, then you should give them education. That's what we are saying. If you give education, if you people get knowledge, then they will be able to find the way by themselves. If you just give money and property and things like that, and don't, don't teach them how to use those inner resources, they will always be in problem. It happened in Tibet. There is a story of happening, such happenings in Tibet. There, there were some of the kings came and they were very wor worried about the gap between the rich and people. And then the king used his power and made all of the people same. Two, three times, same. Then again, the rich were becoming richer, poor people are becoming poorer. And after Chinese invasion also, I was told it is happening like that. You see? So it may be your, your karma or inner resources, whatever, you know. So what, what is important is not, not just to make them same by distributing the money, which may be good, <laughs> right? I mean, communism also started like that, right? Look up, let us look after the proletariat, the working class people, distribute the wealth. It didn't solve the problem. Again, same, rich are very rich, poor are very poor. And even in those days, I visited Russia many times. Even in those days, when communism was practiced, I found that the leaders were like living in such glorious palaces. They, they, they now call it dacha. If you visit one of those dachas, it's like they have all the amenities even at that time. <laughs> right? So therefore, if you want to help people, Help them in their education, in their knowledge. Help them how to address their own problem through exercising some of, the, using some of the inner resources. Okay? So therefore, second is bodhicitta. The wish to become Buddha for all sentient beings. That means the wish to help all other people through giving them proper insight, proper education. So there cannot be a mind more benevolent, more altruistic than the mind of bodhicitta. Compassion is very important. But bodhicitta says, may I become the highest, the most powerful one to help everybody. The third is called correct view. 
correct view means the wisdom, understanding, shunyata or emptiness. In other words, wisdom which sees the way things are. As I, as I briefly mentioned yesterday, we, we get all these problems because we are not able to see the things as they are. We are not able to make progress because we, we, we don't want to see what we should be seeing, but we keep on seeing what we want to see. Similarly, listening. We keep on hearing what is good for you to hear, what strikes your chord, <laughs> not what you should be listening. So that's why like when you listen to such a teachings also, you will normally you will end up picking all those things which, which, which relates to your thinking. If the teachings relate to your thinking, then you will say, oh, wonderful teaching. <laughs> If it's not in harmony with your teaching, I say, oh, what is this? He's, we are living in a modern society. His, his, teachings are, his teachings are a little bit backward. You know, this, this is not what we practice in the West. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yes, you have every right to scrutinize, judge all the teachings. The Buddha himself said, you know, just as the goldsmith judges the gold by cutting, rubbing, and putting under the fire. Similarly, well judge my teachings and accept them, not because you respect me. That's the beauty of Buddha's teaching. So we have every right to uh, scrutinize and judge and analyze, but you should not write away, throw those things away, because it does not fit your thinking. Because if, if you know, if things have to fit in your kind of thinking, then we should not talk about impermanence. We should talk about permanence, you know. You get married, buy this house, buy four cars, live happily forever. Say those things. Don't talk about renunciation. Talk about how to collect money, become rich, engage in competition. Huh? Things like that. Don't worry about what is happening in the world. It's none of your business. You just take care. There are people who actually say these things. This. It's none of my business to talk about other people. I'll take care of myself. You see? So things like that. This is what we are doing, you know. So if, if you want to listen to something that is comfortable, then talk about what is the latest business trend. What kind of mobile phones are there in the market right now? Things like that, you see? So that will not solve our problem. That will not lead us to get long-lasting happiness. So therefore, we are talking about the importance of developing these inner resources. Correct view means wisdom. I'm using the word wisdom. I'm not talking about knowledge. I'm not talking about messages. I'm not talking about information. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about knowledge, I'm talking about wisdom. Somebody gave a very beautiful explanation about these three things. Information is reading all the books about how to build a ship. There's information. You have all the information, but you don't know how to build a ship. Knowledge is that which helps you build the ship. Big progress. But it, it is the wisdom that will ensure that the ship does not sink. <laughs> so wisdom is something is very much related to your personal experience, related to morality, many wonderful practices. Right? So, so we are talking about wisdom that sees the things as they are. As they are, not what you want to see, as they are. So we'll we'll talk more about this later on. Have some questions? Yes, many hands.
Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm a bit stuck with something about the negative emotions mm. and um, how also, because you say like abandon, well, that's how it uh, um, resonates with me, abandon negative emotions because they are not helpful. But also the point of view of just seeing them as a um, phenomena arising and ceasing. So sometimes when we practice or when I practice, it, it's just about thinking about, about them of something that it is not important, the content, if it's negative or positive, but just, I don't know if, if I'm explaining myself, but just like not clinging into it. So just, just like this phenomena happening of the mind is not really to put like it's negative or positive or just the clinging of not, sorry, not the clinging of it. Yeah. Because I'm a bit like now in my head is yeah, like yeah, yeah, confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, Thank true, you. true. The scientists today say there is nothing called a negative or positive emotion. Emotions are emotion. All emotions are necessary. That is what scientists say. All emotions are necessary. It is from this understanding we have this famous phrase fight and flight response. A famous quotation or phrase in science, fight and flight response. Meaning that it is because of these emotions that you will be able to fight if your life is in danger or if you can't fight, flight, run away. It's because of this emotion. If you don't have these emotions, you will not be able to fight, you will not be able to run away, so you will not be able to protect yourself. So they are necessary. That's, that's what they say. Now they are changing this phrase a little bit. Now they are saying, don't react immediately with this notion of fight and flight response. Take time, think a little bit, you will find a better answer. That's what they are saying now as far as I understand. So anyway, but I did not find any, you know, meet any scientists who say too much anger is good. Too much attachment is good. At a very rudimentary level, just for your survival, some of these negation, negative emotions like maybe, maybe necessary. But if you let them go out of control, it is very bad. We can all see that. So that level, I think science also probably support the Buddhist teachings, right? That's one way of thinking things. And then the second thing, your question is very important. The second thing is, the problem with us is, when we look at an object, attractive object, we develop attachment, and then we chase that object until you get that object, you chase it. You get obsessed with it. You think about that object the day and the night. I, I should have this mobile phone, what, now 15? 15 or 14, 15, mobile phone 15. You know, in the night, you have no money, but still you have mobile phone 15 in your dream, <laughs> things, things like that, right? <laughs> right. So we chase it, that's the problem. As you rightly mentioned, as, in the, as, as you mentioned in the Dzogchen practice, if you imagine yourself just a spectator, let the emotions rise and go. Don't chase the object. Don't don't, don't interrupt the emotion. Then it's no problem. It's like the, like the the waves rising in the water and then going back into the water. That's actually quite high practice. So if you if you you know imagine yourself just a spectator. Don't chase. Don't run after them. Don't let yourself influenced by these negative emotions. Then I think it's okay. Yeah, next question. Yes. Question regarding attachment. Yeah. I'm wondering um, if not being attached to anything is a condition for happiness, and there's no attachment to my best friends, no attachment to my family, and no attachment to my life. Um, how can I keep a feeling of deep sense of life then? Yes, true, true. Good question. Now, this confusion is more with the English word attachment. How, how you would explain it, you see? Okay. 
So, depends upon how you explain this word. For example, in Buddhism, we don't say desire is bad. With the desire, there are positive things, negative things. The desire to become Buddha is good. The desire to kill somebody is bad. So, can we make similar distinction with attachment? Probably not. I don't know. So, anyway, the important part is make a clear distinction between attachment and love. Love your parents, love your relatives, but don't get obsessed with them. That is what we are saying. Having no attachment means don't get obsessed with them, don't get stuck there, don't immobilize yourself because of your link towards your dear and near ones. That's what we are saying. So attachment is normally you know, explained with an example, saying that attachment is like a drop of oil, drop of oil that falls on a piece of cloth. Then the oil gets stuck there, very difficult to get it separated from that piece of cloth. So similarly, when we have attachment, we get obsessed with that object. And then we start thinking, I can't live without this person. Right? Whereas in the case of unconditional love, that unconditional love is primarily cultivated through wisdom. That this person also like me, want happiness, not want suffering. Therefore, I should look after them. Especially my parents' relatives, they are very much related to me and kind to me. Therefore, I should look after them. In that sense, you, you get connected with them, you help them, make your life meaningful. But don't get stuck there, don't get obsessed with them. Right? So that, that I think is uh, the difference. The other day I said, you love, you, you give unconditional love, but reduce business love. <laughs> because the most of the problem we get is, I love this person because my, my parent, whatever, I love them because they have been so kind to me. At the end of the day, you are the reason. They are not the reason, you are the reason. They are good to me, therefore. This cloth is useful to me, therefore, this is nice. Not they are important. In a positive way, yes, yeah, they are kind to me, but I'm not important. They are being good is important. They are good people. They are kind people. They have, they have been helping me, therefore I must repay the kindness. Not because of excessive obsession with yourself, but just, just a conventional I that has been helped, nominal I that has been helped, with less ego grasping, right? Then you get this connection and repay their kindness. That's the process. That, that's actually, of course, not easy to practice. But if you are able to do that, then it's really like somebody watching from a, a grandfather. I, I always give this image of a grandfather watching the little child playing at a distance. The grandfather, because of his age and experience, will not be so sensitive, you know crying, shouting like the new mother. <laughs> but he, he will be watching at a distance and really taking care of this little child, make sure that she doesn't fall. She is watching, but he will not express it too much. Right? Our ordinary emotion is like a newly wed couple. So much emotion, you know. So much hugging and touching. Ah, oh, be careful, oh, you will fall. Ah. And you yourself become vulnerable in that process, <laughs> right? So something like that, probably. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hello, Geshla. Uh, um, it was seven years ago, exactly today. I was here for my first <laughs> introduction course, and it was um, profound and life-changing. And when I got home, uh, a friend of mine who was suffering asked me for help, and. Um, I saw him make positive changes in his life, but six months later, he, he killed himself with a shotgun. Uh -huh. um, since then, I've, I have made positive changes in a lot of people's lives, but I've realized I'm not wise enough to help anyone with serious mental health issues. Um, more recently, I do have a, a friend that's made multiple suicide attempts, and I have a close family that are, um, have serious 
um, like dangerous uh, mental health problems. And I'm just not sure uh, what to do about it, I guess. On, on one hand, it's just it's hard to develop that um, boater cheetah when I feel like I'm powerless to help the people closest to me. Um, on one hand, I guess I could like stop life as I know it and try to develop clairvoyance. Or um, possibly it's um, if I try the best I can with what I know and maybe it's their karma to experience what they're experiencing and maybe something positive will come out of that in, in this life or the next. Just yeah. not sure which way. Yeah, if, if it is easy to solve all the problems, then the Buddha should have solved all our problems much in advance <laughs> because he is omniscient and unlike us. But he couldn't solve all the problems. Right? So, so therefore, as you rightly mentioned that as best as we can, that is the thing. As best as we can, depending upon our limitation and also the state of that person. When we talk about helping other people, it is not easy. For some people, very easy to help. Because their mental attitude is such, they are really like, mind is sound and they really want to change, they listen to people, very easy to help. Some people very difficult to help. If today you help, they will always be after you. To be after you is not the problem. The problem is they will keep on saying the same thing again and again. They never listen what you are saying. And then they, they like, for example, when you have an issue of somebody who is always saying that, you know, because you are taking care of that person, he always come to you and say, I'm going to kill myself, you know. And, and you have this feeling for other people, and you, you carry it away that person's state. There's no way you can do, because the, the mental state of that person is such. Very difficult to help. So therefore, here you see the real solution. Why we have such people with such tendencies? Because something went wrong in the society much in advance. The society as a whole did not have this loving atmosphere around, nurturing atmosphere around. The society as a whole, you, you produce a bunch of people who are always looking for money, engaging in negative competition, you know, you ignore other people, you know, ignore their well-being. So the end product is people suffering from depression, loneliness, things like that. So there's no easy solution. We need to, therefore, as I was saying yesterday, we need to change the education system, which is, of course, not easy. Not easy doesn't mean you should not do. But, uh, you know, when, when you are grown up in a society where there's no care, no love, you know, everybody is thinking about oneself, exploiting others, you know, how, how can you expect to have people with a sound mind? The most vulnerable people, they, they become crazy, you know. Then they start thinking, oh, what is use of life? I kill myself, things like that, you see. But having said that, there are people who may have come into such a difficult background, but then when they go to a different environment, then they need love, affection, and attention is received, or sometimes some advice is given, they change their life. In my case also, I met at least two, three people who came to me and said, I, I don't see any purpose in my life, I want to commit suicide. And one person who came to me, sent by some other organization to me, I said some very nice things. She just changed like that, on the spot, miracle. Just there she went like, oh, why, why I am thinking about such silly things, you know. What you said really makes sense. Ah, she was happy and went like that. There was another who took a little bit longer, but she understood what I said. Because what I tried to do was, oh, why are you thinking about such a small thing? You are so intelligent, you are so educated, you are so skillful, this, that, you know. I uplifted her and she recognized her potential and she did not commit suicide. There are people like that. So, so it's not the same. For some people you can for some people you need to give a little bit distance. When you help other people, give distance. 
because you're also ordinary human being. You know, in the process of helping other people, you will be carried down by those people. So keep a little bit distance <laughs> and help them. Don't make them too dependent upon you, like as, as I told you, the grandfather's way of helping. Probably, right? Okay, last question, yeah. Uh, hi, Gashala. I have a question about realizing... Where are you? Okay, yeah. Realizing the right view. Yeah. Um, the text says, uh, which is also about realizing emptiness. Yeah. Uh, would you suggest any specific resources or practices to develop this view? You mentioned Dzogchen. We are also practicing Samatha. Some people recommend Vipassana. How does one go about choosing the right no, view? No, no. Luckily, no, there are many, many good texts. Also, very good translations also available. So, you read Tsongkhapa's this thick three volume, Great Stages of the Path. There are many other Namrim teachings. And, uh, yeah, you read, you read all the available explanations on, on Shunyata, on emptiness, right? So basically, if you read this Tsongkhapa's Great Stages of the Path, a very detailed explanation is found in the section on Shamatha. No, sorry, sorry, Vipassana, not Shamatha. Shamatha is one-pointed meditation. Vipassana, analytical meditation. So read both the sections, especially the Vipassana section. Very detailed. But we will ex we'll also discuss later on on this topic. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch.